I'll ask to have a discussion through the chat function and also if you want um, uh, raising your hand, uh, I'll chat for um, uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, so um, I'm Dan Plesch, I'm the director of the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy at SOAS University of London, located in the heart of uh, London by the British Museum um, in the Bloomsbury district. Uh, I guess the first thing to say about uh, our centre is that we are the largest uh, provider of diplomatic uh, international higher education um, in the world. Um, I have more students than, uh, say, Georgetown. Um, and I think that reflects growing interest in what we provide. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we have um, probably about 300 or so uh, students who are all over the world studying online only degrees, uh, suddenly getting more interesting and fashionable now. Um, and 100 plus who are, um, uh, so excuse me, I got slightly distracted here. Um, and 100 so, uh, students coming campus. Uh, over our different uh, degrees. Welcome uh, uh, as people come in. Welcome. So I just want to mention the uh, different programs that we have and then from that um, talk uh, about how people move from you know the teaching that uh, we provide, the learning people go through and the many, many and varied careers that people have. Um, that broadly is, is what I'll, I'll talk about because I know that uh, that is very much at the forefront of why people are making the difficult choice as to what um, program they might want to take, and particularly in these um, uh, bizarre uh, and very unusual times. And you'll see my email on this slide, and we'll email it to, to you. Uh, you're very welcome also to uh, contact me directly. Um, after this session, if you'd like to. So uh, we have a pretty um, wide range of offerings within the center. Uh, we offer uh, four uh, free um, mass open online courses, MOOCs. And whether or not you want to come to us for a degree program, uh, if you're interested in these topics, I would encourage you to uh, experiment with them and uh, 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 enjoy working with them. Uh, I had uh, normally, I guess it's an indication of the the changing times. Um, excuse me one second, I have to break off for one second because my puppy needs letting out the door. Excuse, sorry, I'll be right back. Go on then. Forgive the diversion. So our free uh, online courses are a useful taster. They're a good way of getting into training and preparation for programs. Um, and not in normal times, I would perhaps have about 150 people a week starting um, my UN in the world uh, MOOC. And I noticed that it was almost 800 people uh, started it uh, this, uh, this week. So you'll be in good company. And then when it comes to our taught master's degrees, we don't have undergraduate programs, grad school. Uh, we have uh, a suite of campus programs and a broader suite of online degrees. And I'll just say a word or two about the online degrees first. Uh, quite a lot of them are taught in conjunction and sponsored by the British Foreign Ministry. Uh, these regional programs on South Asia, for example, and East Asia, and Middle East and North Africa are taught in conjunction with the sponsorship from the British Foreign Ministry. But we also provide um, uh, online degrees in security and strategy and public policy. Now, all of our students have a great, I would have to say, have a great experience. About 90% of the students who sign up them get their degrees after two years. These are two year part time degrees that people can do when they're if they're just too busy with life or um, resources or other reasons and don't want to come to London, uh, can study in that way. 
And then we also have our um, core and original suite of online master's degrees, International Studies and Diplomacy, which is a flagship program, and uh, Global Corporations and Policy and Energy and Climate Policy. So you can see from the type of programs that we run that we are all about understanding the world and preparing people to engage with it. And I think if you look uh, at the center's um, homepage and scroll down that, you'll see there's a lot of experience that uh, uh, students will talk about in uh, using our degrees professionally and the fact that these degrees are orientated towards enhancing uh, people's professional development directly. Other degrees, uh, other universities aren't so directly related to um, the policy world. And to give an indication as to how can our theory and practice of learning develops with this, I might just take um, uh, the examples of our corporations degree where you can come and do in one degree uh, in one year, both the international economics and the international law of global corporations, where normally you would need to go and get two separate master's degrees, one in law and one in economics. But we think it's important to integrate in interdisciplinary studies, our broader school, how different schools of thought uh, engage with a topic. And that frankly is what the world and employers need are people who are uh, trained in uh, the old jargon joined up thinking and similarly when in the energy and climate policy there's a tendency to either have climate degrees coming out of environmental science and human geography uh, or um, uh, degrees focused on the extractive industries uh, oil and gas and so on uh, and the integration of those two i think is illustrated by the the question or the point that if you look at two very different countries, Germany and China, which have had very strong development of renewable energy, they have a motive, a public motive of uh, helping combat climate change, but they also have a motive which is not talked about so much on the, on the uh, German side to reduce their dependency on, for example, uh, Russian gas, and on the Chinese side to uh, reduce dependency on importation of oil. Uh, which the American Navy, they fear, might be able to in interfere with. So the, inter the interaction of climate and geopolitics is something that we study in these degrees, but they're also available as options in international studies and diplomacy. And here, too, we're combining rigorous theoretical analysis with uh, practical application. On the practice side, we include... Uh, training in negotiation, in media skills, in policy analysis, and alongside the other campus programs uh, and options for on the online world as well, uh, we build in um, study tours. We've had to interrupt them um, as a small uh, impact of the current uh, disasters, um, but normally we would be offering study tours to continental Europe, um, Ethiopia, and uh, North America uh, as options, depending on which uh, degree you, you take. And these uh, enable, for example, in uh, Addis Ababa, uh, we have meetings scheduled with the foreign minister of Ethiopia. In Geneva, uh, we have our, uh, some of our seminars interacting with the, the top management of some of the major UN institutions in Geneva. And this provides real world interaction uh, for the students. And uh, to take one example, I suppose, as to how we've gone from classroom into uh, real world practice. And our, the center's motto is thinking globally and acting globally. Um, in our class on the UN a couple of years ago, uh, we discussed the question, how did gender equality uh, get into the UN Charter? After all, this was 1945, uh, 70 years ago, uh, there were hardly any 
women in the room in San Francisco when the charter was made? How did that happen? And the conventional uncritical wisdom was that it was perhaps Eleanor Roosevelt or other influential North American or British women. But we found in looking at it that actually this wasn't the case. And the only reason there's gender equality in the charter is because of women from Brazil and the Dominican Republic. And similarly, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, working with colleagues in Stockholm, it's become clear that there were very influential women delegates from India and Pakistan in the negotiation of the Universal Declaration. And this changes a lot of uh, the framing and understanding of uh, the development of gender equality in the United Nations. And in fact, two of our students um, led this work, uh, became research associates of the university at SOAS shortly after graduation, which is almost unheard of, uh, I would say is unheard of. Uh, and then after um, a, de a wide degree of uh, public education and interaction with governments, just uh, earlier this year, the UN itself changed its system-wide education on UN women so that all members of the US UN staff are now taught uh, that it was Southern women, women from um, the Caribbean and uh, Brazil who uh, succeeded in getting gender equality to the charter. And that change in dialogue and discourse is part of what uh, often we, so as we talk about as a decolonizing the curriculum. But that's a way in which we as the center management facilitated students who had the vision and enterprise to go from uh, classroom discussion to really impacting an issue on a, at a global level. Um, so moving on from that um, to think about where are our alumni now? Well, um, here are just half a dozen or so um, examples. Uh, I just had got a very nice email from a recent graduate who just got a job working in the cabinet office uh, of the British government. Um, I have uh, people who become friends now who are working at Chatham House. Um, the two individuals I just referred to on UN Women, one of them is now uh, the press officer for the uh, Red Cross in um, the uh, Democratic uh, Republic of the Congo, the DC, um, and another working for UN Women in Nigeria. Uh, to give another example, there was a student um, uh, from the DRC uh, on, the, on the course who uh, came with us to Geneva. And although they couldn't, we couldn't initially make the contact for them with the, their embassy, their mission in Geneva, uh, with our uh, support, they went and essentially just rang the doorbell and uh, introduced themselves. And 18 months later, uh, they're working as special advisor to uh, the ambassador to the African Union of that country in Addis Ababa. Um, you'll see some of the other uh, examples I put up here. Uh, I remember a gentleman off the uh, corporations course who's gone on to enhance his career at Heineken. Um, a couple of years ago, um, I remember a student, David Franco, very, who went off to Lloyd's of London and now he's in charge of risk analysis uh, at Lloyd's. And uh, again, a student who's become a, a friend and a colleague who came to us actually with a, um, a third class degree in engineering, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Abigiti, uh, and is now a coordinator of strategic programs for uh, the UN FRU program in Rome. So these are I think, some of the trajectories that people uh, go on. Obviously, people don't leap from uh, our degree program directly into mid-level and senior positions, but that's the kind of trajectory that people go on. And I think we, the feedback we get from so many uh, students is that the combination of theoretical and practical um, education uh, gives them a real uh, head start. And the fact also that on the theoretical side, that as I mentioned, with respect to corporations, energy and climate, uh, we're providing um, much needed, but sadly rather rare uh, interdisciplinary study of key topics. 
has helped people a lot in their careers. Um, if you look on our website, uh, and I can't actually, sh the technology doesn't actually um, let me uh, show it to you right now, um, but we can send these slides around. If you look on our center website, you'll see a few examples of our research uh, showing what we do and what you can do. So our yearbook of global studies publishes the best first class dissertations of uh, each cohort each year. And you'll see there the sort of uh, uh, dissertations that uh, the, our best students write and that you might want to aspire to and you know, be in the yearbook for 21-22, uh, why not? Um, and if you look on SOAS Research Online, you'll see uh, for any of our academic staff, you'll see references to our research publications. Um, and then finally, a couple of our policy programs I've highlighted, you can see a number of them on our research pages, uh, but the, that on disarmament, scrap weapons, and that on war crimes, give an indication of how we integrate the involvement of students who wish to volunteer into some of our public policy sessions. So that's uh, our overall approach. Um, and I'm very happy to take your, uh, your thoughts and questions as we go along. And you're very welcome also to email me directly with any questions if you don't want to uh, raise anything now. So I'll, uh, I'll stop now and I'm very welcome to take your thoughts. And I see we've got people already from all over, from London, uh, India, Lebanon, uh, Malaysia, Luxembourg, um, a very wide variety. And that's typical, I suppose. We have some people from some 60 countries uh, in an average year taking our programs. I see we've still got people joining in the session. If you have uh, joined in just now, you're very welcome. Um, I, I say I can happily uh, uh, email and perhaps talk individually if uh, for people are coming in now or later, but very happy to uh, take any thoughts or questions now. Um, I don't want to uh, put anyone on the spot by asking them a question. Uh, I know it's always uh, a little difficult to be the, uh, the first one up, but you're very welcome to uh, take a query. I don't know if our, our moderator wants to uh, uh, jump in. Hi, Dan. So we've got a few questions coming in on the chat function. Can you see those? Um, I'm just... Uh, okay, so uh, just looking at the number of the questions that are coming now, uh, from Megan, um, do I think I, the question of dual multiple citizenships? Um, well, I think it was a German uh, councillor at the embassy in London said, "Well, you can't. One can never have too many passports." Um, of course, some countries uh, are pretty clear that you can only have one nationality, uh, but obviously you you have more options if you have uh, more nationalities or more passports anyway, um, I say except where there's a, an issue with a country not wanting people to have more than one nationality. Uh, let me know if that's a in response to my uh, answers and I'll run through them. Do come back with supplementals. Um, uh, one question from uh, Lily French about um, integrating policy into the international development course. In our department, we don't actually teach international development as a degree or as a module, that's the development studies. Although in um, my UN uh, module, we do uh, necessarily and uh, happily teach um, a, a lecture or two on international development. But I would say that in general, um, policy is, um, integral to all that we do. Um, a lot of my own work, for example, on 
the history of the UN uh, is about history for policy. And we find that actually years ago, people were perhaps more enlightened and involved in uh, policies. For example, uh, back in the, after the Second World War, uh, the, um, the uh, sorry, the support for uh, people coming out of um, uh, Nazi camps, those, those uh, rehabilitation facilities were organized democratically. So the people in them, as part of the rehabilitation, were involved in electing their own management and running them themselves. And that democratic model actually is quite a lot to teach us how we look at refugee camps today. But we also provide training um, in the a diplomatic practice module in policy analysis, and we have specific modules in global public policy. And online, uh, we, are, we now have a, a full degree in global public policy, which looks at um, uh, a whole range of issues. But uh, as you may have noticed uh, from the media at the moment, although the, com the, the current crisis is developing, people are already saying, how will this change policy in the future? and saying, well, on the one hand, it can uh, enhance the necessity of cooperation and multilateralism. And on the other hand, one can see uh, uh, in Israel and in Hungary, uh, leaders looking to seize a more or less dictatorial power, uh, possibly with the excuse of this, rather than the reason of this current crisis. Um, now, um, I'm very happy to see a question from uh, from Venice about Brexit. Um, there's one good news uh, for uh, students, unless I got this wrong, Anna may know. Um, the normally, I would tell, let us say normally, in the last few years, uh, the student visa for um, non-British nationals. Uh, on, in, it used to be non-EU nationals, meant that if you submitted your dissertation in September, you needed to leave the country um, by January. Uh, and now, as if I understand it correctly, um, associated with the uh, master's degrees, the visa permits an open-ended uh, two-year work extension, which actually makes the UK rather more attractive. Um, the university, I think, is yet to decide what it will about uh, fees, whether it will regard um, all of European Union nationals as overseas students. I think that was the plan. But right now, there's such uh, uh, so many things that are up in the air that it's um, hard to say actually what will be the policy. Uh, but certainly the fees for uh, 2020 are already set. and You can find them on the school website. I hope that helps. And is it coming to your mind? Um, ah, I see going back from uh, uh, Megan. Yes, um, we do actively connect um, our alumni with our current students. Uh, one uh, key uh, activity is that every year we have an alumni reception where we bring back the, or invite in the uh, London-based graduates to meet with current students. And when we are in locations such as New York or uh, Geneva on study tours, uh, we provide networking opportunities with local organizations and incl always include our alumni in that. Uh, we don't have a formal um, process of connecting um, students with alumni. There's no direct relationship uh, and that's largely a question of resources on our end with a student body of uh, at any given time on campus and online of about 400. The administration of a mentoring scheme at that scale is a little bit beyond us, but we actively support it. And you can also join um, uh, present and past uh, Facebook uh, groups uh, where the students of uh, previous years continue to interact. Um, and that also goes uh, a further question about, in addition to the um, study tours, uh, what networking opportunities there are. Um, 
we also, I think, do quite a lot of networking in the margins of some of our uh, uh, major public events and lectures um, in that uh, we'll often provide uh, receptions uh, and identify uh, alumni and others and get our students to interact with the the guests and we'll often be inviting a large part of the diplomatic and professional communities in London and give our students uh, an opportunity to interact uh, with them. We, for example, had um, the recently retired head of human rights at the UN uh, come and speak last term and uh, he was, uh, I wouldn't say mob, but there were a large number of our students wanting to talk with him. I think he had a further hour after his uh, lecture just discussing with individuals, um, you know, career ideas and so forth. So the questions keep on coming. This is great. Um, I'm making sure that this will be off the top of my screen. So um, the dissertation. We uh, start teaching the dissertation the day you arrive at SOAS. And if we have to be online for a bit, uh, this is fine because we teach the dissertation with classroom support and also online for the entire year. And uh, we uh, have you write a, an assessed plan for the dissertation in December. It doesn't mean that you can't change um, your topic later in the year, but it's a way of getting into the habit of planning a dissertation and we provide ongoing um, uh, online and personal support uh, through the academic support function individually outside of seminars for, for academic studies and for the dissertation over the course of the year. The range of topics people study is huge. I would just encourage people to get a little bit out of the comfort zone. If you uh, come from a, you know, a particular country, try to write, write about another country. And there's a, perhaps a decolonizing point here. To be blunt, uh, if you're an American or a Brit, you don't think twice about writing a dissertation about Sudan or India. But if you actually come from Sudan and India, the tendency is to want to write about your own country and not necessarily think about the wider world. And when we say think globally, act globally, we do really encourage you to spread your initial wings and think about things as, um, uh, as broadly as you, as you can. Um, the amount of time spent on the dissertation over the, you know, from September through to April is really quite small. It's studied intensively, if this is in the campus programs, it's studied intensively after the examinations in the spring. For the online programs, we have sessions on the dissertation uh, interspersed over the two years, and then there's a write up session. Um, at the end of the two year period. Um, with respect to, uh, to COVID, um, there's no um, different attitude towards international students um, than there is towards uh, uh, domestic UK students. And I'd be astonished if there was. Will the courses start in September 2020? Well, we very much hope so. Um, obviously, we don't know the exact um, the exact situation, but we're already setting in pl in place plans that if we have to, we can start teaching online and bring it on campus uh, at a later stage. And we are, I would say, rarely or uniquely placed to do that because we already successfully teach, uh, for example, British diplomats uh, are studying our online master's programs as we speak and they're not interrupted uh, by the disruptions to campus teaching at all so we have a facility to move online is a different experience obviously there's less hum less human interaction but it's a in many ways it's an equally rich one um, that in a sense you're always uh, engaged with a study group of uh, people there's a uh, you get to talk to your uh, uh, your tutors online, uh, and I think compared to many other universities, actually we are uh, happily in uh, quite a good position to to do that. 
These are great questions. Uh, keep them coming. Um, Hi, Dan. I think we may have missed a question yeah. from Ella. It may have just gone off the top oh, of your I'm screen. Sorry. It says, okay. um, in addition to uh, study trips, are there further networking opportunities to participate in during the top programs? Oh, I, I, I thought I had. Well, the, yes, there are. Um, to a degree, it's dependent upon students putting themselves forward. Uh, there are SOAS careers fairs, and we often give, have opportunities for students to have a reception uh, interaction with visiting speakers and special guests. So, for example, I think we had the uh, ambassador of Ethiopia uh, recently, or the, uh, it's uh, official from the UN, and that's an opportunity for particular students. And there's, for example, like I mentioned, uh, a colleague uh, now at the World Food Program. Um, uh, he comes from a BME background, and he's been involved in uh, a specific mentoring of um, students from that background when he's been back in London. Uh, so we look very much to try to facilitate that as much as we can, and we're always open to further suggestions. Um, Moving on then, um, uh, Lakshmi's question about placement cells. Um, we have a very strong career service. Uh, individual faculty and networking do help with uh, careers. We don't have a formal process of uh, placement um, uh, or internship. Uh, simply because of the size of our pro uh, the overall program with 400 students it's just a little difficult to do that and certainly in the London market there are so many other universities that it's uh, not possible for us to guarantee placements but many opportunities to come across our um, our desks and we share them uh, you know to amnesty at risk analysis places and so on and so forth um, with respect to the UN, um, as a question, the the main way into the Young Professionals Program is the Young Professionals Program and the uh, Joint Professional Officers. Uh, however, um, there are also consultancy opportunities, and one of the things that does occur when students are with us at the UN in New York, or mostly in Geneva is that it's a way of building up contacts and uh, seeing once you see somebody from the HR department, we had a great session, I think, at the WHO actually in February, just before everything shut down, uh, where there were strong interactions between uh, those HR department officials and our students. And those networking opportunities, in a sense, turns the, the CV into a living person, which is obviously um, uh, what's required and yes every student is provided with a dissertation grade um, and we also grade the plan and the overall mark is a is a mix and if you look at our uh, yearbook of global studies those are the the top echelon of the first class uh, dissertations those that got grades in the British system of 75 and above we publish um, as, uh, as as a yearbook and so you can see there the quality um, uh, now, next question from Ella. Um, the short answer is I don't know um, if we uh, what will happen exactly in September. Uh, I don't think anybody knows, but I would say that we, uh, if we have to move a large part of it online, then we're well positioned to do so because that's kind of what we do already. We're, we're geared up to do that, and I think many other uh, universities and departments are scrambling to work out how to teach online if they have to and we do, we already know how to do it um, and indeed you already we already have a facility that campus students can take a 30 credits uh, through uh, online teaching simply because we don't some of our modules are uh, taught I um, have topics which we don't teach online or for part-time students. I know we had a student for, who was flying in from Dublin uh, for studies of part-time and then that actually caused us to, first of all, caused our registry department to allow that student to take the analogous course online. 
Um, so, the difference between global corporations and international studies and diplomacy, uh, there are quite a lot of similarities. Uh, the key thing is that in uh, the global corporations degree, there is a requirement that you take uh, the multinational enterprises uh, core course uh, and indeed global public policy as uh, as core modules for the degree in the um, international studies and diplomacy masters it's a, a much more of a kind of a hagen uh, multi-flavored approach uh, and less got less concentration on uh, compulsory core modules uh, in terms of employment i think they're both uh, very attractive programs i think uh, if i had to pick one um, there are very few universities that produce uh, people who have studied energy and climate change. And I think, uh, I, well, for example, one of our first students of that program is now managing running the whole online portal for the UN uh, FCCC process uh, leading up to the annual COP conferences. Um, another is working in, as head of public affairs for uh, a global construction corporation. So these, uh, this, that integrated teaching uh, in, in climate policy particularly comes to mind, but that isn't to denigrate the other degrees. Um, with respect to the question from uh, Marla about the year, CSD yearbook, if you look, if you just um, uh, look up on the internet, uh, CISD yearbook of global studies, that should just pop up. You could do that now and let me know if you can find it. And I see we've got uh, uh, somebody else joining the session. Very well, you're very welcome just to uh, drop in your questions. You'll see I have a video presentation on our website. Also, you'll see quite a lot of comments from uh, faculty and students uh, on YouTube uh, and uh, a number of our public lectures you'll find there too. And I mentioned earlier the UN Women um, activity and uh, they, those two students, Elise and Fatima, uh, one from Norway and one from Algeria, uh, those women did a TEDx talk, which you can also find online and on our uh, UN Women research page. Ah, oh, Marl, you found it, great. Uh, so yes, if you laughed at the seeing what to your predecessors uh, got up to in their dissertations. If you just uh, Google uh, uh, CISD Yearbook of Global Studies, you'll find it. Well, that was great, if slightly intense from my end. <laughs> so many questions coming in. Uh, hi, Shruti, uh, welcome to the session. Um, if you have any particular questions, uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, type something in, um, uh, or indeed we can, uh, if you raise, if you click the, um, if you click the waving hand um, icon at the bottom, then you can, uh, um, we can talk, uh, um, sorry, I can talk to you in person as well, now or later on. I see there's a question from Montin about uh, learning a foreign language. Um, yes, um, there are opportunities to uh, uh, study elementary or more advanced Arabic and other topics. And I think this coming year, there's a small fee, additional fee associated with that. Um, and that's taught through the SOAS Language Center. You also can take for academic credit uh, a language through uh, that respect, lang the languages department, uh, but those are fairly intense, and I don't necessarily recommend them because, to be frank, one can study uh, languages in many places, but most of the modules that we teach, you can only um, uh, uh, you can only uh, study with us. Um, many of them are quite rare. Uh, Lakshmi's question about uh, the study: uh, We have a variety. Of so as in the terms of them change a little, I can't get into all the um, the detail. 
but uh, we have a, uh, a tour to New York and uh, Washington DC. Um, but when things are operating smoothly, at the present time, we offer study tours um, to uh, Addis Ababa, to North America, uh, to Geneva, and then also those that uh, encompass institutions in uh, Paris uh, <clears throat> uh, and Brussels. And we're looking at, uh, simply because we noted we were in touch with the Austrian embassy, and there's now a, uh, a night train, a night sleeper train, sounds quite romantic, the Vienna, the Vienna uh, ex Express uh, that takes you uh, into Vienna overnight. Uh, from Brussels, and we are thinking of potentially about adding uh, Vienna. But at the moment, we're just dealing with the uh, uh, extremely annoying situation that we've had to uh, cancel uh, most of our uh, study tours for this year. We managed to get the large one of 100 students going to Geneva and get that done in, uh, in February. Um, Well, the, there's a question about COVID-19. At the moment, the plan is to start studies um, as normal at the end of September. At the moment, I also noticed that there are um, quite a lot of events around the end of September that are of all sorts that are being cancelled. And I think... Um, that one of the reasons for that is uh, if they, they, that a lot of those sorts of one-off events require a lot of uh, prior expenditure on the preparations for events in September, and that is unlikely to be possible. But for us as a university, it's our normal activity to start in September, so I would think there's a very good chance that we will start in September or accommodate a, uh, a short delay. I hope that helps, Shruti. Now, um, would I recommend that students build up experiences by working for NGOs before entering the UN? Not necessarily. I think if you've got the experience, uh, then go for it. You know, if you, uh, you may be that you don't get in immediately, um, but I think I do find that the uh, training and practical skills in uh, media negotiation and so forth help. And to be frank, um, with our degrees, you get a double brand recognition. The SOAS is a very strong brand in international institutions and the UN, and um, so too does CISD, Center for Diplomacy, have a strong brand. So they, many employers know what they're getting if they get somebody from us, and they, you know, they're getting good people. Ella, uh, Um, uh, for a sharp question, um, in theory, um, one could take the diplomacy degree. If this is just really some bureaucratic oddities, which I think will change without taking the diplomacy modules with that name. <coughs> but to be frank, if you're a diplomat um, and have skills in uh, economics or international law, these are uh, or languages um, or international relations, these are the key skills. And if you look at the introductory training for um, diplomats at <coughs> in countries around the world, really very small part of the formal governmental education of uh, diplomats actually includes uh, courses with that title. So. It wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt you particularly, but we certainly very strongly recommend that students take the international studies and the international practice, the diplomatic practice modules, um, uh, because certainly in diplomatic practice, that's where a large part of the uh, practice training takes place, as you might imagine. <coughs> Excuse me. I think this little cough I've got is uh, uh, talking related, not COVID related. <laughs> uh, 
Well, I guess I just want, as we're heading towards the end of the session, I would just say my own, I've, always, I've had an academic um, connection. I think I was a research fellow in peace studies at Bradford um, some 30 years ago. Uh, and I've worked professionally running think tanks in the uh, United States, uh, working in the news media, uh, working uh, associated with government in Whitehall, and always keeping a university engagement. It's last 15 years I've really been uh, committed to, as it were, train, helping train the next generation. And I think if you look at our faculty, many of them have uh, real world uh, ongoing consultancies, um, uh, a background uh, in a variety of professions and I think this uh, professional academic synergy is something which we find uh, works and is very rich and is part of our all of our personal missions to help uh, with the development and training of the next generation and I have to say having done this job for over 10 years now uh, every year I'm always excited about the quality of the students um, that come through. We have, um, I suppose, as I said, maybe students from 60 odd countries on campus and more online. And the quality uh, and variety that we have is um, is tremendous. Uh, and some you know, choose, I get to know quite well, they volunteer for my research programs on disarmament and so forth. Others get involved with issues like sport diplomacy um, or corporations. Um, and it provides a very vibrant uh, environment for the students uh, and the faculty alike. Um, there's a question again about um, the offer of assistance for placements. Yes, we do um, uh, offer uh, assistance with internships and further career opportunities, but really because of the, the competitive market in London amongst universities, and the size of our program, we're not able to guarantee these connections. But under the terms of the visa, you're permitted to, I think, work 20 hours a week. And I know uh, sort of one of our part-time students has been working uh, you know, for Amnesty, for the Red Cross, uh, these sorts of agencies, as well as getting involved in other businesses like um, uh, risk control risks and risk assessment. Um, I, another very good question from Ella. Um, is this core, is the program more directed to a desire to a career in diplomacy over careers such as policy and advocacy? No. Um, I think the we see these it's an integrated uh, suite of modules, and I think comparative uh, we have a significant cohort that either on secondment from their governments. Um, uh, it particularly, I think can think of. Um, uh, we very often have one or two students from Indonesia, Japan, and Korea uh, from the foreign ministries coming to get the master's program. Uh, but broadly speaking, I think it's a professional training, intellectual training for people who want to work internationally. And um, if you look at, you mentioned diplomacy, uh, policy, advocacy. There are a great many. Uh, walks of life where you actually need all of those skills. Thanks, Ellen. <laughs> Thank you very much for the um, the quality of the, the questions that uh, uh, you've all uh, been posing. They uh, are uh, um, very useful for us to, to, to enable us to think about what we do and have all been right on the money. Thank you much. Um, the, how many students are studying at the center? Uh, around about 400, which I think makes us the largest uh, provider of diplomatic related uh, education in the world. About 300 of those are studying uh, online only in some of the programs we do with the British Foreign Ministry. Uh, and you'll see those listed. 
um, and then 100, 120 are uh, on campus each year. Obviously, the numbers go up and down. Um, it would be that we're probably going to have rather more um, online students, perhaps than campus students this year, but you never know. And we also have a cohort of about 20 doctoral students, some of whom are involved in teaching. Well, you, uh, the question about two-year master's courses, um, visa restrictions uh, mean that unless it changes, uh, my understanding is that for non-UK nationals, you need to take the master's in one year, although this may change. You never know. Uh, the uh, online degrees are all taught over two years, and 90% of the students complete their degrees online in two years. I say 90% as a uh, point in our favor because, uh, frankly, um, a lot of across the whole sector globally, uh, we think that we hear that only about uh, or about half of the students tend to drop out or not complete their online degrees. Um, um, I think if you are and have the option and you're in London and want to study for uh, two years or even three years, it enables you to do more work, but it also enables you to take, I wouldn't say more leisurely, um, but experience enables you to get more out of the university in terms of side events and activities if you're around campus for two years. That I think would be um, uh, the main uh, issue. With respect to a PhD, um, some students go on to study uh, master's in diplomacy, um, uh, sorry, a PhD in global studies. Um, I think there are the politics department, other larger departments have larger PhD programs. Uh, so we tend, we're very open to the idea, but we tend to have a fairly small um, PhD cohort within the center as such. Um, with respect to the government of politics of Southeast Asia, uh, it's not a module that I um, teach myself. I can probably put you in touch with the people who email me who do deal with this. Um, the, what we endeavor to do with these, if it's, um, uh, if this is taught through the politics department, you may need to talk to or contact the convener in the politics department of that module. When it comes to the online regional um, specialisms, we emphasize the integration of culture and economics and politics as different lenses to study these regions rather than simply political science. Yes, you can defer. I've never known a deferral request uh, rejected. That is, you can accept for 2020 and then defer to 2021. And it doesn't need to be your final question, Ella, you can have another. Well, I see we've still got 20 odd people on the, uh, uh, the chat. So um, I would just encourage you to uh, poke around our website, um, see more information about our modules, about the academics who teach them, um, testimonials from uh, current and former students, and also some of our activities through our research programs and things you can find on, on YouTube. And we'll send around the few slides I used at the beginning. Great. Anna, Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I think we're probably just about ready to wrap up. Oh, <laughs> one more question. <laughs> 
Uh, okay. Deferral policies, you simply have to ask admission for deferral. Um, uh, we, um, we don't really have waivers. They're pretty strict um, uh, requirements on the, for language, as you could, might imagine. Um, if people come who really can't cope with studying in English, then the only people who are happy are the, the Treasury Department at the university who take the money, and the students aren't happy, the faculty aren't uh, happy, and the fellow students aren't happy. So we do need to make sure that people are going to be comfortable uh, studying. I would say we do uh, take account your work experience. If you, uh, for example, have a degree that's 10 years ago that wasn't particularly wonderful, uh, but have been doing lots of interesting things since and are, are accustomed to working professionally, then we would often take that into consideration in, in terms of admissions. Um, one final point about COVID, I would say, I mean, I'm just rejigging my uh, online UN module, which goes live in uh, April, um, uh, because that's when our, on our online degrees start, in April as well as in October. You're welcome to come and join them. We still have a few vacancies, I think. Um, but certainly looking at the implications of COVID-19, the history and future of the WHO, you know, uh, these sorts of organizations are certainly rather more interesting uh, to students. And as I said at the beginning, this, um, I don't want to make a cartoon of it, but on the one hand, you say, well, the response to crisis is more authoritarianism. And the other hand, the response to crisis is, well, this shows that an individualist approach to the international system by individuals or by nations just really doesn't work. And we have that international collaboration is a necessity, not just an option. So I think that's how we're starting to think about the COVID-19 as we uh, look to incorporate it, these events into our, um, as it were, real world life studies. Well, do feel free to email me directly. You'll see it on the slides, uh, dp27. Uh, you're very welcome to be in touch with me. Um, and I hope to be able to welcome you either online uh, programs starting in April or in October or uh, in September to our, uh, to our campus programs in London. Great. Thanks so much, Dan. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. Um, as Dan has said, we will um, share a recording of the session, if you've missed anything, for those of you who joined um, later on. Um, and I will also send around some information with um, contact information for Dan and um, others in the program. So thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, and we'll be in touch soon.